I am a divorce attorney from Massachusetts and I did lies for a while where I would basically say, if you have a question that you wanna answer, I can't be really specific because I can't give legal advice per se, but sometimes I might be able to answer it in a way where I can give you some general advice, point you in the right direction. Here we go. Does forensic evaluators say their opinions to you for a custody evaluation? Yes. So in Massachusetts, we refer to those as guardian litem investigations. And so what happens there is that they'll interview the children, the parties, and yes, they write out a report. If the judge has allowed, the GAL can basically email us the report and then we read that and guardian ad litem to be able to speak with them if there's two attorneys we need to make sure that both attorneys are involved because if they're not then you can say oh you know they were favoring the other side because they were talking to them so we try not to do that but like they usually will email us the report our clients can't have it so i am also a guardian ad litem i went through the training i'm not doing it currently because i really didn't like doing it that much a lot of times they'll ask questions where they need to be able to fill in a story or they might ask a question because the other side's making an allegation same with everything there's good gals and there's bad gals and hopefully you get a good one can i make a temporary restraining order permanent if the physical abuse stop but x is using my cards and social security number. Different states are very different. So I've heard permanent restraining orders be used in other states to basically refer to what we refer to as a temporary restraining order. So a temporary restraining order in Massachusetts is usually granted for about one year. It might be a little bit shorter, could be a little bit longer, but typically if you say how long is a restraining order, it's gonna be a year. After a period of time, if providing appropriate notice, you can ask for a permanent restraining order if the abuse was serious enough. So check about the laws in your states. You could always call the courthouse and just say, you know, how do I go about making my temporary restraining order permanent? And they should be able to give you that information. Again, there's a number of things that could have happened, but here in Massachusetts, you can basically file a motion on a return date. Let's say it's been two or three years. You could file a motion saying that the next time we come in, I want a permanent restraining order because I don't want to keep reliving the trauma year after year of having to come in, tell my story, see my abuser. And then at that hearing, the judge would decide whether or not to grant a permanent restraining order. Do you have to create a motion for order of attorney fees or if it's already in the petition, it's enough? If you're talking about a contempt, usually for any sort of attorney fees, you still have to file a motion. Again, Massachusetts. But in a contempt, it usually is in the complaint as well, but we still have to file the motion. It still has to have proper service. In Massachusetts, there has to be an affidavit that lays out how much the attorney fees are and goes through a couple of things that are required by the court. So I would always file a motion, even though if it's mentioned in there, I wouldn't rely on that. What's the difference between informal and formal? I'm not sure where you are, but I know just the difference between Rhode Island and Massachusetts, very different procedure in regards to divorce. In Massachusetts, we don't necessarily have an informal or formal trial. In criminal court, we have a jury trial and a bench trial, which might be kind of what you're referring to. Divorce and custody, we don't have jury trials. They're only bench trials in family court. But I know a state like Texas, my understanding, I don't know the laws there. But what I have heard is that Texas still has jury trials for divorce. Judge rules are on custody 5-3. Still don't have a copy. Is it normal to take so long? If I'm understanding this correctly, you guys went to court on May 3rd. I'm guessing on a temporary hearing, like a motion for temporary orders. Usually, again, Massachusetts is where I'm from. But if you go in, what happens at the end of the hearing, and I think a lot of people find this very annoying because they don't understand. They think they're going to go into court, they're going to go in front of the judge, and they're going to know what's going to happen at that time. Unless you come to a stipulation that day, the judge does what they call take it under advisement. And basically that means that they're gonna decide it later. And you get an order that they write up, usually in the mail. If you have an attorney, maybe they get it via email. 
and it can take quite a while. Pre-pandemic, you know, we could usually count on a temporary order being issued anywhere from a week to a month after the hearing. Now, sometimes we've had cases where it can take, you know, a couple months, three months to be able to get an order. I had one case that the case actually was scheduled for trial before we even got a temporary order. So it can be really frustrating, even as an attorney working in the system, when it's your own life hanging by the line, you're waiting for a judge to do their job that can be so incredibly frustrating. So five, three, you know, you've only been about four weeks or so. In Massachusetts, you can jump online and check and see if the judge has actually posted the pleading. If they have posted it and you have an attorney, we can pull the document offline. And sometimes that's the quickest way to do it rather than wait for it to come in the mail. Not sure about other states. I wouldn't be too concerned just four weeks. If it gets to be another week or two, you could always call the court and just say, I don't have my order. What's going on with it? So good luck. What if you have a 209A restraining order against the father whom is now trying to file for custody? So a restraining order in and of itself, if a parent is looking for custody in family court, isn't necessarily going to prevent them from getting it. This is very, very fact dependent. In my opinion, the restraining order is complete BS. You know, I look at everything and I'm like, there's actual proof here to show that the other person was not telling the truth. If they obtain the restraining order in district court and check the right boxes, then the court there can give the person who receives the 209A so legal and physical custody of the child. And then the other parent can't see the child until they go into family court. So they go into family court, they seek a parenting schedule of custody. So I had a case where the restraining order was extended, but we went into to family court and I remember the mom's attorney looked at me and she said, Heather, my client has a restraining order. Your client is not getting 50-50. And I looked at her and I said, well, let's take it to the judge then. And we did. And my client won 50-50. So a restraining order in and of itself is not enough to keep them from getting custody. But depending on the facts that brought the restraining order and the validity of those facts, does physical violence play out, you know, that definitely is a factor. If somebody is abusing the other parent, as long as you argue it correctly, that can be used against the parent. But they can still ask. You can ask anything you want in court. What are the best questions to ask when looking for a good divorce attorney? This is a great question. I know I've done a couple videos on this, but I think one thing is what's the expectation of communication? Communication is probably one of the most important things that you can have with your attorney. Even with working a case, We've reached out to attorneys on the other side and then it's like crickets. We can't get them to respond. So either we have to file something in court just to force them basically to come to the table. So if you have an attorney who isn't getting back to you, that's obviously you know important. I think sometimes going to Google and looking at reviews, but not necessarily the good reviews, if they have no bad reviews, they're probably all fake reviews, but look for one star, two star, and see how they respond to that. Do they care? If they care about bad reviews, more than likely they give a shit about your case. I would be looking for that. I know for anything across the board, that's the first thing I do, you know, look for the bad reviews and you know, you weigh that as is, but how do they treat those reviews? I think other questions are the experience somebody's had, what happens if there's a problem, how do things get explained? Make sure you understand how you're getting billed. You know, there's a difference between flat fee, hourly rates. Most of all, read your legal agreement. If an attorney sends you a legal agreement, like ours is extensive. Ours I think is four or five pages and it is built that way for a reason to lay out the rights and responsibilities, you know, what you can expect from us, what we need to expect from you. Just make sure you do that. The question is, what if you cannot afford an attorney and is doing it yourself in a divorce case? And I think this is a great question because there are a lot of resources out there that can help you. Don't just trust Google. You need to know where your source is coming from, but do your research. Understand what it is that the judge needs to hear if you're walking up. Now in Massachusetts, every courthouse, every family court has something called the lawyer of the day. It's a completely free program. I've volunteered for it. People in my firm has volunteered for it. And what happens is an attorney volunteers for the day and you can go in and you can ask them any questions you want. They can help you. I've filled out paperwork for people. I've talked to them 
them about how to argue to get their point across to the judge. So that's a really good way if you can't afford hiring a private attorney to be able to go in. Now, just recognize the fact that they're only going to be spending limited time with you. What I have found in my own practice is sometimes people give me a 15 minute overview of what's going on. And then I dig in a little bit more and find things that are very different than what they told me within those 15 minutes. And the difference in those facts might significantly change my advice. So just keep that in mind too, that if you're only giving an attorney a snippet of what's going on and they give you advice, they might not have the whole picture. Another thing you can do is, I know the Mass Bar Association has, I think it's once a month they run it, you can call in and you can speak with a lawyer. Also, if you can't afford to retain a lawyer, it might be that maybe you can hire a lawyer for a couple hours to really dig into your case, to go through, to prepare things for you. So there's different ways you can do it. You just need to know what your budget is, but anyone can represent themselves. You do not need a lawyer to get through court. Just make sure you understand understand it and you're being able to put your best foot forward. Practice your speech a lot of times. And I think this is the downfall of representing yourself. I always recommend, you know, bring a bullet point list to court with you. So you make sure that you're addressing the very important things. But when you hear the other side attack you, and that's usually what happens in family court, there's a lot of mudslinging going on. They get up and they attack you and they just go, 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 go. And then what often happens is you start responding to that, you get emotional, and then the judge isn't hearing what they need to hear in order to give you what you're looking for. And I think that's the biggest downfall. So if you can remove yourself from the emotional side of it and really prepare yourself and your headset in order to go in and ignore all the emotional side, you'll be in a much better position. What's the likelihood of finding a new representation for a long-term case set for trial in three months, mass probate? Three months to get prepped for a trial that you haven't been involved in, that's complex. We've represented thousands of people. I can think of two off the top of my head that we've taken on that had probably somewhere between two to four months. Usually we'll turn them down. A lot of times what we'll do is say, look, you have a huge case file. We need to know whether or not our hands are completely tied because a lot of times if we haven't done the divorce itself, what we find is we come in at the end and it's almost like, you know, we're tied at the wrist, we're handcuffed because discovery hasn't been completed. You know, we don't have all the documentation that we'd need, but discovery might be closed. So we can't even bring that in. With three months, if you're going to do it, like if you're gonna switch over, get moving on that as soon as possible. And I guess the only other thing I could say is you're saying a long-term case. So my guess is the judge might not continue the case, but sometimes if a new attorney is coming in, a judge would understand why the trial might need to be continued. So sometimes the judges don't like to continue it just because of the number of trials that are being set out. You know, they can be set really far in the future, but act sooner than later if you're really thinking about moving. Ex abused our child. There's DSS findings and a 50B. He hired an attorney and I'm pro se, any advice? So I'm not sure where you are. I'm guessing it's not Massachusetts because we refer to social services here as DCF. For us, you know, it would be just the next step of an investigation. I'm not sure if it's the same for you or not. Our social services do not happen in court initially unless it's a juvenile issue where DCF is actually taking custody of your child. That's going to happen in court. Here we call that a care and protection case. So if that's happening in court, both parents are appointed a lawyer as long as they qualify for one because of the fact that custody is an issue. Now on a regular DCF case, let's just say there's allegations made that I abused my child. So DCF gets a call from whether it's a mandatory reporter or somebody who is just letting them know and they say, Heather's abusing her child. So you need to go investigate this. And they look through it and they say, okay, yeah, there's enough for us to investigate. So they start the investigation. I believe they have 14 days from the point that that's called in to do their investigation and decide whether or not they're concerned, whether they're going to open it, whether they're going to say, man, we don't really think there's enough here. They do their first investigation. Our 50 B is the next step. They've said, yeah, there's enough here. We're going to substantiate allegations of either abuse, neglect. And so they do that. 
And then DCF gets involved, which is super fun because, you know, you love having them in your life. So they get involved and they come up with plans and, you know, hoops you have to jump through in order to get them out of your life. Now, if you disagree, you can basically file for a fair hearing here in Massachusetts. And that usually is when an attorney will come in. Now you can go through the investigation, you can have an attorney with you, which depending on the situation, a lot of times we do recommend. Sometimes it might be enough for an attorney just to tell you what to say or how to say it, because how to say something is often just as important as what you're saying. But if he has an attorney in your pro se, that probably doesn't matter as much where you're saying they're the ones that abuse the child. My guess is they're hiring an attorney just to try to protect themselves. What have you seen with one parent wanting a passport for a child and the other parent refuses? This is, I don't wanna say an uncommon situation because I think it's fairly common, although not in every single case. If the divorce is pending, a lot of times what the judge will do is look at what the history has been. If the parents, while they were together, you know, are traveling out of the country with the child, the child already has a passport, and then all of a sudden, just because they're going through court, one parent says, I don't want you to leave. You know, now I'm afraid you're gonna kidnap the child, you're gonna leave, you're never coming back. The judge will look at that and say, okay, you guys traveled outside of the country while you're together. There's really no reason that you can't do that now. Unless there's certain allegations, you know, we've had cases where one parent will say, I'm leaving and never coming back. If it's something like that, yeah, you have a much better chance at the judge basically saying that one parent or both parents can't leave the country with the child during the pendency of the litigation. Now, after the litigation is over, most judges, I think, if you're planning a vacation and even if one parent says, I don't want them to go, as long as it's not to a dangerous place, if you went to court and said, you know, we're going on vacation to this country, most judges are gonna allow that. I think it's just a matter of being reasonable. What is the average cost of custody trial? I would say that there isn't necessarily an average cost. I think it depends on how long your custody trial is gonna take. So we've had cases where a judge will say, look, this situation seems very minimal. We're gonna give you four hours of trial. That is a very, very small trial, probably not a ton of documents. You're probably not dealing with a ton of witnesses so it's probably just both parents testifying and then the judge is going to make a ruling. But then we've had custody trials that have taken seven to 10 days just because of the extensiveness of it. Usually not just a custody trial, there's a divorce involved in there. Average cost, I believe it's, I think four to six hours of prep for every hour of trial. So if that's not including your post-trial pleadings. Trials are usually not a good idea. There are some cases that require them, but if you can avoid having to go to trial, the expense of it, the emotional side of it, it's probably going to be better overall. Now that can be very difficult because if you honestly believe that the other parent shouldn't get what they're asking for, it can be very hard. How do you settle on your child? That's tough. What if you have physical proof evidence that the father is a threat to the mother and child? Do they take that into consideration in family court? Yes, it has to be presented in the right way. It also depends on what that physical proof and evidence is. There's some things that are stronger than others. And I've seen situations, unfortunately, and I'm not saying that this is your situation at all, but we see the worst side of people. You know, I've seen people make up evidence. I personally believe that if you find that somebody has made up evidence and lied, one, that person should be thrown into jail immediately. So some of it just goes into what exactly is the physical physical proof and the evidence and how strong is that. But yes, if you have it, it's taken into consideration, at least here, most of the time. <laughs> What if there was an incident at the other parent's home? I can assume what maybe your question means. So if there was an incident at the other parent's home and let's say it was an abusive situation, let's say the children were in danger, if you know about it at the time it's happening in Massachusetts, and I don't know if this is in other states as well, I would assume they have something like this. You can call your local police station or the police station where the other parent lives and ask to do a well-being check for your child. And sometimes that might even just give you the peace of mind mind of knowing whether or not they're okay. That's not the end all of everything. You know, we've seen cases where the police show up and the kids are crying and they're obviously upset and the police are like, all right, well, it's a family court issue. I tend to think police are typically good. You know, I think most police are going to be concerned and let you know that. And a lot of times if the police do get involved, even if they don't do anything, they might call DCF and file a 51A. So if you're going through a divorce, everything in the past can 
basically come in. If you're going for a modification, you can really only point back to the time that that judgment entered. Now, domestic violence and abuse, the court does have to consider things even prior to that, but there's different weights that are given to it. It's kind of a complex question to answer. What if X recorded a Zoom call with children and therapist? Depends on your state. In Massachusetts, that is illegal. In Massachusetts, we are a two-party consent state, which means both sides need to agree for something to be recorded. Now, let's say I'm here on a TikTok and you record this, even though I'm not necessarily saying, here's my consent to record me, I think the social media aspect and the fact that I know TikTok is recording this in and of itself, that probably would be enough. But if they're secretly recording something, I'm assuming because if you press the button on a Zoom, it lets everyone know that it's being recorded. If that were the case, I'm assuming the therapist would have just ended you know, the session. I'm assuming there's probably like a camera going on in the background. That's illegal. At least here, if you're in a one party consent state like Rhode Island, only one person has to agree. Let's say I have Caitlin over here. Let's say Caitlin and I are having a phone call and I'm part of the call. So I agree for it to be recorded. If I was in Rhode Island, that's legal. Massachusetts, not legal. So it depends on your state. Do judges usually listen to our counsel? Yeah, I think they do. I think even more so sometimes than GALs. The problem being with our counsel is they're giving the voice of the child. And I think in some cases, especially a case where you have two parents that are each telling you very different things, what they're saying a child's saying. So like we've had a case where the kids were actually older. I think they were like 17. And both parents were saying that the kids each wanted to live with them individually and have nothing to do with the other parent. So our counsel came in, it was the perfect situation because they just went in, they listened to both kids, and then they reported specifically what the kids were saying to the judge. So it eliminated that he said, she said stuff that goes on. And in Massachusetts, our counsel is a, an attorney representing a child. It's a free service. It's somebody who's volunteering their time who will actually take on the representation of the child. It's not a best interest standard, which is what a GAL investigation does. You know, when they look at everything and they give recommendations to the judge, they're doing it based on what they believe, based on their investigation, what's in the child's best interest. ARC's counsel, their job is to to basically be almost like a game of telephone. I hear it from the child, I report it to the court. So that best interest isn't necessarily there. Then it falls into the judge, you know, then has to make that best interest standard. Let's say the seven-year-old is saying that they want to live with parent A. And when art counsel says, well, why do you want to live with parent A? And they say, well, at parent A's house, I get to eat all the candy and I get to stay up and they don't make me do chores. And when I'm at parent B's house, I can get in trouble. That's going to get reported to the court. And just because the seven-year-old wants to live with parent A, that doesn't mean that they're going to. To answer this question, the judges listen to art counsel. They don't necessarily do what art counsel is saying. And in Massachusetts, kids don't get to decide. You know, it's not until 14 really that they start having any weight involved to what they're looking for. And even at 14, I've seen so many people say, oh, at 14, the child gets to decide. No, they don't. They don't. Even at 16, they don't. A child should never have enough power to decide what's going on in their parents' lives. That is a parent's role, not a child's role. Thanks for stopping by. I really appreciate it. Bye-bye.